Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I am one of the Ath Fellows this year. The extent to which the power of lawmaking is allocated directly to the people varies from state to state. One of the defining features of the California political system is the frequent use of the initiative process through which policy issues are determined via the direct popular vote. In this election season, Californians will vote on an astonishing on an astonishing 17 propositions covering topics including the death penalty, legalizing marijuana, criminal sentencing, firearms, and ammunition sales. Tonight's panelists, Bob Stern and Tony Quinn, are two of California's most respected political commentators. They will analyze the consequences of this election's historic outcomes. The discussion tonight will be moderated by Professor Kenneth Miller, who will also present the Rose Institute's video voter series of informational videos produced by Rose Institute students. Bob Stern has been called the godfather of modern political reform in California and is the co-founder and former president of the Center for Governmental Studies, a California think tank dedicated to political reform. Mr. Stern has previously served as a staff attorney for the California Legislature's Assembly Elections Committee, the Elections Council to the California Secretary of State's Office, and was the principal drafter of the City of Los Angeles's Ethics and Public Campaign Financing Laws. He is a graduate of Pomona College and Stanford Law. Tony Quinn is the co-editor of the California Target Book, a nonpartisan almanac of California politics. Dr. Quinn is an author on California political trends and demographics and has served as an assistant to the California Attorney General, the Director of the Office of Economic Research in the Department of Commerce, and as a member of the California Fair Political Practices Commission. He holds degrees from Georgetown University, the University of Texas, and Claremont Graduate University. Professor Kenneth Miller is a member of the Government Department at CMC and is the Associate Director of the Rose Institute his research focuses on state government institutions with emphasis on direct democracy and the interaction between law and politics. This Athenaeum panel discussion is co-sponsored by the Rose Institute for, the state, for state and local government. As always, audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please join me in welcoming the panelists to the Athenaeum. Well, thank you for the introduction and thanks all to you for coming to our discussion tonight of the uh, California uh, ballot, spe specifically the 17 ballot measures that are going to be on uh, this November ballot this year. Uh, they represent um, mostly initiatives placed on the ballot by citizens. There are also two legislatively referred um, measures and one referendum that would overturn an act of the legislature. And we'll talk a little bit more about the differences between those. Um, and uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the resources that we're providing you with here tonight. Uh, the first you'll find on your table, this is uh, the work of Rose Institute students. Um, it's a backgrounder on all 17 measures, and so you can refer to that tonight. We also have some materials from the League of Women Voters um, scattered through uh, the uh, uh, Athenaeum here. And we're going to be showing you uh, a handful of the, the videos that our students at the Rose Institute have produced, one for each of the 17 measures. And we encourage you uh, to take your time after tonight's uh, sort of introduction to the videos, go online and, and take a look at um, all of them. They're all about two to three minutes long, and they provide a nice overview of the measure, um, both arguments for and against, well, a summary of the measure, arguments for and against, and the major proponents and opponents. So it gives you in a very condensed way an, an overview of the measure as you'll see when we show a few of them here. I do want to recognize uh, the people who are responsible for the, this project this year at the Rose Institute um, and I'll ask them if they're here tonight to stand. Um, first, uh, the student group, the nine students who were involved um, in um, producing the white papers and the videos. Let's start with Alec Lapata, who is the lead student on the project. <laughs> A special shout out to Alec. Um, he's a rabid Cubs fan, and he's here <laughs> during World, you know, World Series Game Two. Um, I hear the Cubs are doing. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe they're doing bad. Maybe good. I don't know. Maybe everyone's taping it. Plug your ears. I don't know. So, okay. So, um, uh, thanks for being here during the game. Um, also, Wes Edwards with the uh, the camera there. Um, 
Ty Tyler Finn. Is Tyler here tonight? Uh, very good. Uh, Grace Lee, one of our uh, research students, is also here. Ellen Lempris is in the back. Hi, Ellen. Uh, Bryn Miller, I saw her earlier. There you are. Uh, Tamara Skinner, also at the same table. Uh, Skip Wiltshire Gordon, uh, maybe watching the game. I don't know. And Zach, Zachary Wong. That's my name. Okay, so those were the students, and they, they invested a lot of time starting last summer and especially a lot of time in September putting together this, these videos. Um, and I also want to recognize from the Office of Public Affairs Cameron Grimm and Joanne Young, who put in an enormous amount of time producing these videos. Finally, <laughs> finally I want to uh, thank our friends here, especially Bob Stern, who drove out from Malibu uh, like four or five times, I don't know, quite a lot, to be here working with our students on, on the project. Um, so thank you, Bob. And our friend Tony Quinn, who um, offered some great advice from Sacramento on, on how best to hone these videos as well. So. Thank you. Um, I want to say one more thing about this project. This, this, was, this has been a Rosen Street project, not just this year, it goes back a couple of election cycles. And this wasn't an idea of me or, or Andy Bush or any of the staff at the Rosen Institute. This was a student-initiated project. And that's one of the things that we really value at the Rosen Institute and the CMC generally, is that students get to take initiative and come up with ideas and develop them. And working with faculty members and outside experts We've really um, made this a collaborative project, and the students this year really, I think, raised the videos and this whole project to a new level. They've been recognized um, by outside uh, respected groups. The League of Women Voters of California have posted these videos on their statewide website, uh, their voter information website. Um, it's been mentioned in Politico, and we expect some other media references to the, the project in the, in the coming days. So this is something I think we can all be proud of as an organization, as a college, this project that um, we've been working on. So that's part of what we're doing tonight is celebrating this project and we're also gonna have some discussion about these ballot measures and um, more broadly about the political season if you're interested in the Q&A. But the, the, the most important thing that we wanna do is kind of highlight what's on this ballot. Um, we get a lot of media coverage of the presidential election, not so much about other state politics and not a whole lot except for um, campaign ads on a few of these measures. You'll see, if you're watching TV, a lot of campaign ads on a few of them, but a lot of these measures don't get the attention, um, and so that's one of the reasons we do this project, is to give voters um, broader information. So the way we want to structure the evening, and I'm, I'm gonna give Bob and Tony some opportunity to give some opening remarks, and then we're gonna show just a few of the videos, have them comment on that, and then we're gonna open it up for discussion with, with um, the audience here. So Bob, why don't we start with you? Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It was just a pleasure to work with the students. I mean, you have great students here, and they did a fabulous job on these videos. And as you watch the videos, remember this. Not only did they do all the research, which was terrific, and started this summer doing the research, they had to prepare the scripts. And then if you'll notice as you're watching them, they memorized the script. And I thought that was just incredible. I would have just gone nuts trying to memorize. It's hard enough just to present it and to be on video, but to actually memorize it. So, so watch for that, it was fabulous. But tonight, I want to let you know that the ballot pamphlet and your ballot is like an action movie. You didn't know that, I'll bet. Well, what does an action movie have? Well, it has drugs. <laughs> that's Prop 64, the marijuana initiative. It has sex. That's Prop 60, the condoms initiative. It has death. Prop 62 and 66, death penalty, has smoking in it, movies still have smoking, Prop 56. It has prisoners in it, that's Prop 57. And of course it has money, and most of them have uh, money involved in it. So as you're lamenting the fact you have to consider 17 measures, think of the action movie, but also be very grateful that you don't live in San Francisco, because in San Francisco there are 25 more local measures be grateful you don't live in San Diego. In San Diego City, there are 17 more measures. Now, in LA County, we do have two more measures on the ballot. And if you live in LA City, there are four more. But as I say, there's good news and bad news. And the, and the good news is that you're not living in San Francisco and San Diego for all those measures. 
So with that, Tony, why don't you make a few comments? Well, thank you very much. It's my third time here with the, uh, uh, <clears throat> with the ballot measures. I think this is one of the most interesting campaign years, certainly, that we've gone through, although not necessarily in this state. But who would have believed when this thing started that the most famous Bush would be Billy Bush? <laughs> and that he would be the only person who's lost his job so, so far. Uh, we have 17 ballot measures because the legislature decided uh, a couple of years ago that they didn't like having measures on the uh, June uh, uh, primary ballot because the June voters are more uh, cons uh, conservative, less likely to vote uh, for tax uh, measures, and they thought that that the measures that they're interested in seeing passed would do better if they were put on to the fall ballot. Well, that means we have a whole lot of them. I think maybe they will rethink this, frankly, had they put some of these measures on the June ballot. We had a very unusual election in June. You had the big Clinton-Sanders race, so the Democratic turnout was, was huge, and the Republican race had already been decided, so it was rather low. Uh, but nevertheless, we have all of these. Uh, I think that there's only been one issue in this country, uh, this entire election process, and that is since he came down the escalator in Trump Tower, that's Mr. Trump. And that seems to just take all the oxygen. I don't know, maybe with Bob might or Ken might agree, but I've never seen an election in which this one person has just dominated all of the talk. That doesn't mean he's going to do very well. I think he's going to do rather, rather uh, uh, badly myself. But we get a situation in California. We are the ATM. We, nobody campaigns here. All the candidates come here. They have fund fundraisers. Uh, President Obama was just here for one the other day. He did stop off. He really wants to see Daryl Issa defeated, the congressman that has given him lots of problems over the past eight years. So he went out of his way to go down to uh, uh, San Diego and campaign against him. And we do have some interesting races, especially at the legislative and congressional level. We have a sleepy United States Senate race, which is unusual in that we've not had an open Senate seat in, 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 in 24 years. So this is a very unusual year, and I guess so we have to get into these ballot measures right. now. <laughs> don't, don't we? Yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna start, um, we're gonna, uh, the, the, the plan is to show a, a video, um, they run again about three minutes or a little bit less, and then have some comments on it, and then we'll, we'll move through, I would say four or maybe five, um, that's all we really have time for in order to allow for more discussion. But we'll start with Proposition uh, 64, that would legalize marijuana, it's the one that probably has some of the most statewide and national attention. My name is Zachary Wong, and I'm a sophomore here at Claremont McKenna College. I'm here to discuss Proposition 64, the initiative to legalize marijuana in California. Although federal laws continue to criminalize marijuana, many states have legalized it at the state level, either for medical use only or for general use. Twenty years ago, California became the first state to legalize medical marijuana. Now, four states, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska have legalized marijuana for general use. This year, five more states, including California, will vote on similar measures. In 2010, California voters rejected a marijuana legalization initiative by seven point margin. This year, proponents return with Prop 64. Among other provisions, Prop 64 would legalize marijuana for adult use, impose a 15% tax on retail sales of non-medical marijuana, and additional taxes for cultivation, prohibit marketing marijuana to minors, authorize state agencies to regulate the marijuana industry, and allow resentencing of those convicted for marijuana offenses. The legislative analyst estimates that Prop 64 would eventually generate up to $1 billion of tax revenue annually for state and local governments. Supporters include Drug Policy Alliance, California NAACP, California Medical Association, California Democratic Party, and Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. Major funding for Prop 64 has come from Silicon Valley entrepreneur Sean Parker and progressive groups that seek drug legalization. 
They say Prop 64 would end a criminalization policy that does more harm than good, establish comprehensive regulation of marijuana production, sale, and use, generate substantial new tax revenues, and allocate those revenues responsibly. Opponents include Senator Dianne Feinstein, California Hospital Association, California Association of Highway Patrolmen, California Police Chiefs Association, and the California Republican Party. They say Prop 64 would increase marijuana use, including among minors, lead to more impaired driving and highway fatalities, harm underprivileged neighborhoods, and weaken local control over marijuana cultivation and sale. A yes vote on Prop 64 would legalize marijuana for adult use and establish a system for taxing and regulating marijuana in California. A no vote would retain California's existing marijuana laws. For more information on Proposition 64, visit roseinstitute.org and these other sites. Okay. <clears throat> nice job, Zach. Very good. Well, this is going to be a very close vote. In fact, my son is voting yes, and, and my wife is voting no, so I may be the deciding vote. <laughs> newspapers, four newspapers are supporting it, three newspapers are against it. So this, I think, is going to be very close. As, as Zach said, that um, we voted on this a, a few years ago, and 46% of the people voted yes. I, it will be more than 46. The question is, will it be more than 50%? Um, this one is going to be very significant in the sense we'll be the fifth state, but the largest state if we pass this. And then that will send a message to the federal government to change its uh, regulation of marijuana as a, as a drug. Uh, and we'll see uh, whether they'll do that. My assumption is if there's a Clinton administration, they will. If there's a Trump administration, maybe not. So this one, I think, is one that I'm undecided about. And so I'm really interested in hearing other people's views on it. Well, I thought this was an interesting one that has gotten the most attention, but the actual campaign for it, there hasn't been much. I got from the Sacramento Bee the uh, money that's being spent on all of these ballot measures. And uh, by my estimate and the Bee's estimate, there's going to be more than $450 million spent in California by proponents and uh, oppo opponents of these 17 measures, partially because the public really isn't, isn't interested, therefore they've got to get their atten attention. Uh, this one, I think most people kind of have some feeling for it. Uh, there's only been $7 million spent for it and no money has been spent against it to speak of. And S Sean Parker, the Silicon Valley guy, is the source of virtually all of the money for it. My two problems with it, and I actually voted no, but I was kind of torn because there's a big marijuana industry out there and it's certainly not going to go, go away, is we do have the uh, federal government, it's their policy that, that uh, this is a, a, a controlled drug, so we're voting against the policy of the, of the federal government. I don't know that that's a particularly important idea, uh, matter, but. Uh, California acts like it's its own country every so often, and we're doing that this time. I am quite bothered by the fact that there's no standard at all for people driving when they are under the influence of this drug, whereas we have very strict standards, as you know, for uh, alco alcohol. Uh, and I think that was probably what made me want to vote no. If the highway patrol said, yeah, we know what we're going to do, we know when we've got an intoxicated driver, we, we have a protocol for handling that, I might have been for it, but I'm kind of really worried uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that you know, we're getting into an area where we don't know uh, what the legal ramifications are going to be. I think it's interesting, I think the public is going to pass Prop 56, which will add uh, taxes onto the uh, uh, to uh, tobacco industry. I wonder if the tobacco industry, since they are in the business of making things that you smoke, whether they'll try to take over the new legalized pot uh, bi uh, bi uh, business. I think that's, that's another thing that we don't know. So there seem to me to be a whole lot of unknowns with this measure. Well, as I said, I'm unknown, but since I'm an attorney and we need to have equal time, I'll present the yes side just okay. for a moment. If you're driving while impaired, you can be arrested, obviously, and marijuana, if you're driving while impaired with marijuana, you can be arrested. And the problem is that we don't have standards because um, there hasn't been the resources to develop those standards. It's very, you can't take a blood test, apparently, with marijuana. 
um, or, I mean, or breathalyzer test. Um, so this initiative actually sets aside money to develop those standards, whereas we have now people who are driving who are impaired with marijuana and there are no, no standards set. The initiative will provide money to set those standards. So I think the initiative goes a long ways to try to, um, to have more studies of this and also to take care of that situation. Um, the, um, so I, I, the initiative, by the way, is 60 pages long. That's why this ballot pamphlet is so long, is because of the initiative. And they've consulted with lots of different people and have tried to make it as, uh, as comprehensive as possible. What, when we did our book, Democracy by Initiative, however, we find, found that when initiatives are long, they tend to go down. So I'm not so sure it's going to pass. I think it's going to be with somewhere between 53 and 47, one way or the other. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And the polling has showed this is, this is also fairly close. There are a lot of church groups uh, that are, are opposed. And uh, uh, I mean, there's been virtually no campaign, which kind of surprised me. So I think that this one is, you know, people may say, hey, this looks too complicated. Uh, we don't need to do it. And, you know, the pot, the pot growers are actually against it, apparently. We're, we're they seeing they don't want any, uh, anybody reg regulating them. We are seeing TV ads here, though. Uh, are you seeing them Yeah, for it, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the second one on our list uh, for tonight, which is the Crime Initiative, and Tyler Finn is presenting. My name is Tyler Finn. I'm a senior at Claremont McKenna College, and I'm here to discuss Proposition 57, the Criminal Sentencing Initiative. From the 1980s through the early 2000s, Californians responded to rising crime rates by approving tough-on-crime initiatives aimed at putting offenders behind bars for longer terms. Defenders of these measures say they reduced crime rates, but critics say they made the system too punitive and too costly. Over time, California's prisons became overcrowded, and in 2009, the federal courts ordered California to reduce its prison population. During the past decade, California has reduced its inmate population from approximately 173,000 to 128,000. Some say more should be done to reduce sentences and promote rehabilitation, while others argue that shortening sentences will lead to increased crime. Prop 57 would increase the ability of nonviolent inmates to seek early parole consideration, increase opportunities for early release credits for good behavior and education, and require that juveniles be tried in adult court only after a hearing and determination by a judge. Governor Jerry Brown is the leading proponent and funder of Proposition 57. Other supporters include former Republican House Speaker Newt Gingrich, Los Angeles Police Chief Charlie Beck, and the California Democratic Party. Supporters say Prop 57 would address the prison overcrowding crisis, save taxpayer dollars by reducing spending on prisons, and keep the most dangerous offenders locked up while promoting rehabilitation of nonviolent offenders. Opponents include 50 of the state's 58 district attorneys, including the L.A. County D.A., many sheriffs, and multiple Republican elected officials. They say Prop 57 would result in higher crime rates, apply not only to nonviolent offenders, but also to violent criminals, and overturn key provisions of voter-approved victims' rights legislation. In summary, voting yes on Proposition 57 would promote early release for some offenders convicted of nonviolent crimes and would allow only judges to determine whether or not to try juveniles in adult court. Voting no on Proposition 57 would reject these changes. For more information on Proposition 57, check out roseinstitute.org and these other sites. Okay. It's a little hard to figure out. Yeah. She's very good. It's a little hard to figure out what this one's doing on the ballot right, right now. We passed Proposition 47 just two years ago. That was in, in something like this. It, it reduced uh, uh, the, the prison uh, uh, population for nonviolent uh, of, of, of offenders. And uh, the judges at the local level all of a sudden found a whole bunch of new people that they had to deal with at the local level. So there were a lot of unknown consequences of passing Proposition uh, 47. I'm amused by the fact that one of the things that it did, which nobody seemed to realize at the time, and that's why these measures uh, are probably not the best way to do complicated uh, public policy, 
Uh, the old Prop 47 actually reduced California's gun laws. They made it harder uh, to prosecute people for, for certain gun, gun uh, crimes. So now we have the gun measure, which tries to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to correct that. I'm sort of ambivalent about this. I'm impressed by the fact that the DAs, who are in the business of, 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 of prosecuting criminals, are so strongly against it. I know there is virtually no money being spent against it. Uh, that the law enforcement groups, such as they are, and they're not as effective as they used to be, are putting their money into the, the death, death, uh, to the death penalty. Uh, and I suspect that it will probably pass. But I think you're going to find in a couple of years that there are unknown consequences and we'll probably end up coming back with some kind of another measure to take care of any problems that this one causes. Yeah, I think this one's going to be very, very close also because I think people are going to have a tough time trying to figure out what it does. And when people are confused, they tend to vote no. Now, interesting, on this one, three newspapers, including the LA Times, have editorialized in favor of it, and four have editorialized against it. This is a high priority of Jerry Brown. He's the one who pushed it through. It probably should have gone through the legislative route, but he decided to do it this way. We have the San Diego DA supporting it. We have the LA police chief, Charlie Beck, supporting it. But as Tony pointed out, 50 of the 58 DAs are opposed to it. Again, I think this will be a very close vote. I just have a feeling it's, gonna, it's not going to pass. I'll just make one other comment about this. I, th I think it's, this is characteristic of um, this ballot in general, is that it is basically most of these measures are supported by progressives or the left. And this is an example of reducing pr prison sentences uh, for various offenders. And it's in, it's in contrast to where the, the way the b ballot was predominantly used in the 1970s, 80s, mm -hmm. and 90s, which was largely conservative groups seeking to reduce taxes or increase criminal penalties or things like that. So that's one of the characteristics of the state becoming increasingly progressive is that the proponents of these types of measures are trying to take advantage of uh, changes in the in the state to undo some of the measures that were the more like the tough on crime measures and others that were enacted back in the um, the earlier period. And ironically, the s legislature is controlled by Democrats, so you'd think that the Democrats would pass these things, right. but you'll see it throughout this ballot pamphlet the Democrats are stymied by increasing cigarette taxes, don't want to be voting on the death penalty, don't want to be voting on marijuana don't want to be voting on releasing prisoners because they're worried about being defeated. So that's why you have all these initiatives, plus the fact that this is a presidential year. You won't see that many progressive initiatives, I think, in two years, but a presidential year brings out a lot more people, a lot more Democrats voting. One of the oddities of this measure is, 40 years ago, the first Jerry Brown, uh, who was governor when he actually had, had, had some hair, uh, he, he was a big proponent of changing the criminal uh, uh, sentencing process then, and they established, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, something called the in, in, indeterminate sentence, which was thought to be a great uh, idea, a great progressive reform in 1975 or so when it passed. Well, a lot of people didn't like the way it worked. So one of the things that this measure does is it reverses what Jerry Brown had championed when he was there as governor the first time. So what you have is Jerry Brown number two trying to re repeal what Jerry Brown num uh, number, uh, number one did. I do think that's one of the oddities of this particular measure. And Jerry Brown number two is not running for president. Jerry Brown number one was. <laughs> yes, and Jerry Brown number two would run for president, except he was too old. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one, which is the, uh, the tobacco tax and Alex Lapata. Hi, my name is Alec Lapata. I'm a sophomore at Claremont McKenna College, and today I'm going to be discussing Proposition 56, the initiative to increase the tobacco tax. California has long been considered a leader in the efforts to curb smoking. It implemented the first indoor smoking ban and recently passed a law to increase the age to purchase tobacco to 21. California also has the second lowest smoking rate in the nation. However, California's tobacco tax is low compared to many other states, and efforts to raise the tax has only had mixed success. Voters approved increases of the tobacco tax in 1988 and 1998, but initiatives failed in 2006 and 2012. Proposition 56 would increase the tax on cigarettes by $2 a pack. 
and increase the tax on related products, including cigars, chewing tobacco, and e-cigarettes by similar amounts. It would also direct revenues to state programs, including healthcare, tobacco-related disease research, and tobacco prevention and control. The measure would exempt revenues from the state law that guarantees funds for public schools. The state estimates that Prop 56 would generate between $1 and $1.4 billion in new revenues per year. Supporters include the California Hospital Association, the California Medical Association, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, and the California Democratic Party. They say that increasing the tobacco tax is a proven method to reduce teen smoking, and that it would help reduce tobacco-related health care costs that smokers impose on the rest of society. Opponents include the California Taxpayers Association, the California Republican Party, and tobacco companies R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris. They say that the tobacco tax is a regressive tax and that it disproportionately burdens the poor. They also say that more of the revenue should be used to fund public schools. The powerful healthcare and tobacco industries are spending heavily on opposite sides of this initiative. In summary, a yes vote on Prop 56 would authorize a $2 increase in the tobacco tax and allocate revenues from this tax to fund several state programs related to smoking. A no vote on Prop 56 would reject this tax increase and maintain the current tobacco tax in California. For more information on Prop 56, please visit roseinstitute.org and these other sites. All right, round of applause for Alec. Nice job. Good job. Good job. Looking sharp there, too, on the, the bow tie. It's it nice. All right. So, a comment. Well, I think this one may go down, even though it only affects probably 13% of, uh, of Californians who smoke. And the reason I think it's going to go down is we're seeing huge amounts of money being spent against it. And our research indicates that when a large amount of money is spent against an initiative, 90% of the time it's defeated, no matter what. Because when voters are confused, they tend to vote no. Now, I hope this initiative passes, and I hope I am wrong about this, and this may be one example where maybe, maybe I might be wrong, but I'm really concerned that it will go down, with, with, and I think the ads are somewhat misleading. They're talking about special interests supporting it. Well, the biggest special interests are the tobacco companies who are opposing it. Um, and it, one of the arguments is it's going to hurt the poor. Well, in a sense, it's going to make the poor more healthy. Yes, the poor would have to pay more taxes, but probably they'll stop smoking, and that's good for the poor. Um, so we'll watch this one because I, it, 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 this is where big money is being spent against it, and usually that means the proposition is defeated. I actually take somebody of, of a different view on, 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 this, on this one. I mean, we've had these things on the ballot before. Uh, they've been on generally in, in the uh, pr uh, primary, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there was one in the primary that went down by a very, very narrow margin. If you look at the electorate in the general, it's more likely to be in favor of this. Now, I think it has a couple of interesting impacts. Uh, people say that too much of California's tax burden is on that top 1%. One, uh, one percent. We're going to get to that with Prop 55 in a, in a minute. Well, this one requires poor people to pay more taxes because the people that smoke now are, are basically poor, poor people. Uh, I do think also that raising this tax will probably create something of a, of a, 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 a black market. Uh, you know, that is sort of the economic thing. You make it too expensive and people will buy cigarettes in Nevada and send them across the border, and that kind of thing. But I think it's going to pass because people are kind of sick of the uh, uh, tobacco companies. And I'm a great believer, and I don't know whether, whether Ken and Bob would agree, but I think the voters figure these things out. I've gotten more mailers telling me this is about special interests that are trying to, uh, you know, buy the election. Nowhere in the mailers that I've gotten has anybody said anything about tobacco taxes. And yet I pick up my newspaper. What do I read? Uh, 60 million, let me see here, Prop uh, 56. Uh, $40 million thus far spent by Philip Morris. Uh, 24 million spent by R.J. Ren Reynolds. I don't think it's going to be very hard for the proponents, and they do have some some money. The hospitals are behind this, and a few very wealthy people. I don't think it's going to be too hard for them to get a message across that says, "Hey, the big losers in this thing are going to be the tobacco companies, and they're not telling you the uh, truth." And I don't think voters uh, uh, li uh, uh, like like that. Well, I hope Tony is right. <laughs> You and I don't agree on much, do we? 
All right, good. So I, I do think this is a test of the, the, the general principle that Bob indicates that big no money leads to a defeat because I think this is the type of election, um, the type of electorate where this measure should pass, but yeah. the big money is definitely on the, on the no side. Okay, let's go on to the next one, which is Prop 55 and, and Grace Lee. Hi, my name is Grace Lee. I'm a senior at Claremont McKenna College, and I'm here to discuss Proposition 55, an initiative to continue current tax rates for high-income taxpayers. Four years ago, voters approved Prop 30, a measure that temporarily increased, among other taxes, the income tax rate on high earners, those who make more than $250,000 per year. For those making $1 million per year or more, the income tax rates increased to 13.3%, the highest rate in the nation. This increase in the state income tax was set to phase out at the end of 2018. Proposition 55 would extend the temporary income tax rates on high earners for an additional 12 years until 2030, designate approximately half of the revenues generated to K-14 education, and create a new budget formula that would set aside up to $2 billion per year in new spending on the state's Medi-Cal program. Supporters say that Prop 55 would maintain current income tax rates and ensure that the wealthiest Californians pay their fair share. They also say that Prop 55 would provide needed money to schools. It would restore the funding that was cut during the recession and also protect against future cuts. Supporters of Prop 55 include the California Democratic Party and the Coalition of Public Employee Unions and Healthcare Organizations, from the California Teachers Association to the California Hospital Association. Opponents say that Prop 55 violates the spirit of Prop 30, which was meant to be a temporary tax increase. They argue it is not needed because the state now has a budget surplus and education spending has grown by $24.6 billion since 2012. They also say Prop 55 would increase California's reliance on high-income taxpayers and risk driving some of them out of the state. Opponents include the California Republican Party, California Taxpayers Association, the California Chamber of Commerce, and the National Federation of Independent Business. Voting yes on Prop 55 would extend the temporary income tax rate increase for 12 years for high-income taxpayers that voters adopted in 2012. Approximately half of the revenues would go to education with additional money to health care. Voting no on Prop 55 would allow the temporary income tax increase adopted in 2012 to phase out at the end of 2018. For more information on Proposition 55, check out roseinstitute.org and these other sites. All right, so good. That's good. Well, this one's fascinating because there is no opposition to it in terms of money to opposition. You would think that the high wealth people would, and chambers of commerce and the business organizations would be spending money against it. They're not. The other interesting part is Prop 30 a few years ago also increased the sales tax by one half of 1%. That expires at the end of this year, and this proposition doesn't extend the sales tax. So it's only going to affect some of you out here in the audience who are making lots of money. Most of us are not going to be affected. That's why I think it's going to pass, because there's no opposition and because it doesn't affect very many of us who are not that wealthy. Yeah, I think that this thing is going to pass, although there are some there really are some serious policy issues that get raised here. But for one thing, rich people are not exactly beloved these, uh, these days. Uh, Prop 30 was supposed to have been a temporary tax. If you've been around the legislature and that as long as, as I was, you know there is no such thing as a temporary tax. Once it gets in, it, uh, it uh, stays in. Uh, the wealthy uh, interest groups you know, the Chamber of Commerce and the anti-tax people, they failed to stop Prop 30, and they had a better argument there because that had that sales tax that affected everybody here. They look at this thing and they say, well, what the hell do we care if all the Silicon Valley billionaires have to pay something more and if Jane, uh, if, if Barbara Streisand has to pay more uh, taxes? 
in this state, and as you're seeing in this election, it's the upper income now that are supporting the more uh, uh, pro uh, progressive uh, causes. So I think that uh, this measure almost certainly will pass because I think everybody who would have normally opposed it has decided not to. Uh, there's been a long argument, and most economists tend to agree that we are too much dependent upon the very top. Uh, that is the, the top 1% uh, uh, that pays something like 40% of the income tax because we have this highly uh, uh, progressive tax. What happens is uh, there are times when the super rich are not quite so rich. And when you have a, when the uh, economy slows down and the stock, mar stock market drops, suddenly people are selling their stock portfolios at a loss, not at a gain. So in, in good times, the uh, uh, <coughs> amount of money that's available to the state due to rich people paying a lot of taxes goes like that. In bad times, it goes like uh, that. You take a look at what caused the really bad recession that we had about 10 years ago. It was this heavy uh, reliance on the super rich because they weren't, just, they weren't that, that to many of them. All that said, I think the public doesn't care about the super rich like they don't care about the, the uh, tobacco companies. And since nobody says don't screw them, the public's going to say fine, let's, let's vote uh, for it. And I'm guessing most of the public don't understand the importance of the volatility no, in really state don't. revenues, which is actually quite important, but not well understood. Okay, let's do one more um, video. This is West on uh, legislative procedures. Hi, my name is Wesley Edwards. I'm a junior at Claremont McKenna College, and today I'll be discussing Proposition 54, the initiative that seeks to increase transparency in the California legislature. Prop 54 addresses two issues, last minute amendments to bills and the recording and posting of legislative proceedings. Under current procedures, before the final vote on a bill, the legislature can remove a bill's contents, replace them with new provisions unrelated to the original topic of the bill, and quickly vote on the bill without hearings, debate, or testimony in open session. This is sometimes called gut and amend. With respect to video recordings, the California Channel broadcasts many legislative proceedings, but the legislature is not required to record and broadcast its proceedings, and it does not allow the public to record its proceedings. First, Prop 54 would prohibit the legislature from voting on a bill, with certain exceptions for emergencies, unless the final bill has been in print and online for at least 72 hours. It would require the legislature to maintain and publish recordings of its proceedings directly online, and it would allow anyone to record open legislative proceedings and to use recordings in political advertisements. The Legislative Analyst's Office estimates that the recording provision of Prop 54 will cost the state approximately $1 to $2 million in initial costs and $1 million annually. Prop 54's main supporter and funder is Charles Munger Jr., a government reform activist. The measure is also supported by pro-transparency groups, including California Common Cause and the League of Women Voters of California, as well as other organizations, including the California Republican Party. Supporters argued that Prop 54 would restrict the legislature's deceptive gut and amend procedure, reduce special interest influence, and promote accountability by increasing public access to the legislative process. The leading opponents of Prop 54 include the California Democratic Party and labor groups. They argue that Prop 54 would hamstring legislators as they attempt to make compromises to pass contentious legislation, actually increase special interest influence, and lead to an increase in negative political attack ads. In conclusion, voting yes on Proposition 54 would be a vote in favor of requiring bills to be published both in print and online for at least 72 hours prior to final vote, of requiring the legislature to create, maintain, and publish audiovisual recordings of its proceedings, and allowing anyone to record open legislative proceedings. A vote no would be a vote against implementing these new changes. For more information, visit roseinstitute.org and these other sites. Well, this is my favorite proposition. Uh, I worked in the California legislature. I was in Sacramento for 13 years. And let me tell you that the last few days of the session are chaos. And there are some times when they will actually distribute a bill, handwritten on the bill, and say, OK, time to vote on the bill, with no notice to anybody. So this takes care of that situation. 
it, ironically, it's being funded by Charles Munger Jr. and also by a former Republican state senator, Sam Blakesley, and I'm receiving mailers on this one. They're spending about $10 million to support this. They consider it so important. So I think this is one that will pass probably by 70 to 75 percent of the vote because the public really likes transparency. Yeah, if you think they don't like rich people, think of what they think about pol uh, po politicians. <laughs> I agree with everything that Bob said. I worked in the legislature, and I can remember those long nights. We'd have to take the staff over and sit in the back of the assembly chamber, and they had, you know, 400 bills they had to pass before uh, 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 midnight, and they were all off in their little corners and in their cubby holes making last-minute deals and rewriting stuff, and we were supposed to analyze these handwritten things and tell everybody what they uh, were, and. The poor legislators had generally no idea. They wanted to go home. They'd been there for six, 16 hours. The whole process, it, it's, it's never worked well to allow all of the major decisions to be made at the very end. Uh, and this does attack that. It says you got to have your, your measure in print within uh, uh, 72 hours. I'm sure Bob saw, and I certainly saw the times when the very sophisticated uh, uh, lobbyists, and they, the things that lobbyists lobby on are very technical, very complicated, and very important to their clients. And they would have these things written out to be, take everything, to gut and amend the bill, as it's called, take everything out of the bill, put in what the lobbyist and the leadership has agreed to, and then get it passed at, uh, uh, one, at one minute to mid, uh, uh, midnight with nobody ever well, knowing what it was. Well, as an attorney, let me argue against it now, because you haven't, you, you've already been hearing pros. <laughs> the reason the Democratic Party is against this and labor organizations are against this is they're very concerned that progressive legislation needs to be amended at the last minute because they're worried that tobacco companies, insurance companies, and, and corporations will be able to kill bills uh, if there's a 72-hour notice. They also are very concerned about um, the money being spent on the legislative hearings. Um, you, if, if there's a district hearing, you have to bring a TV camera to that. That costs money. And they're also concerned about the uh, fact that anybody can record legislative proceedings and use them in campaign attack ads. So those are the arguments they're using against it. Uh, as I say, it's the Democratic Party that sets against the Republican Party. But legal and voters and common cause are with the Republican Party on this. Yeah, Charles Munger also is the guy that gave us uh, part of the uh, 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 commission process for redistricting for the uh, congressional part. And I believe he was also one of the people that was behind the top two uh, 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 primary. It's kind of odd in this state in the last 10 years where the Republican Party has virtually ceased to be a, 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 a party that nevertheless it's been from the Republican side that these kind of, uh, of, of, of reform measures have, have, have been pushed. And in this case, it's Mr. Munger, who funds a lot of, of, uh, of uh, Republican causes, puts a lot of money in it through, a, 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 through a totally separate uh, super PAC that he has. He puts a lot of money, like you know, this year probably 15 or $20 million into uh, various uh, uh, le uh, legislative races, and yet he took this on as his special cause, and thus far he's had a pretty good uh, coalition behind it. I don't, don't think there's any real organized uh, opposition to well, it, is it's there? It's the Democratic Party. Yeah. So <clears throat> I guess one other note to make about this. this. This illustrates the power of the initiative process, because the legislature itself would not have enacted this reform, right? And so this is... There are many examples out there, you look historically at the initiative process, where if the legislature would not do a reform, um, interested people on the outside can mobilize to try to reform the legislature from the outside, term limits being an example, um, campaign finance reform and others. Um, and, and so whether it's a good reform or not, it's just an example of how the initiative process can change government from the outside. Now I would love to show more of these videos, they're terrific as you can see. But I also, we also as a panel want to um, create enough time for the audience to engage in discussion. So I'm going to encourage you after you leave here tonight to go home and get online and watch the other videos. Also, if, if you do have friends or family members who might be, uh, especially if they're California voters, might be uh, looking for some help as they um, are preparing to vote in a couple of weeks, 
I encourage you to email a link to the Rose Institute website and these videos. Um, we're trying to get as much circulation of these as we can. We spend a lot of time and effort preparing them, and we like to get the maximum advantage out of them. So with that, I want to thank our panelists and open it up to the audience for questions. now have time for questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and Sarah or I will come to you. Hi, um, I'm from the League of Women Voters and we've been going around doing our pros and cons. And the proposition uh, that I have been getting the most questions about is Prop 61. And I'd like to hear your take on it. That is the drug measure and the reason that you're getting so many questions about it is that's the really big spender. As of, of, uh, as of two, a week ago, uh, the uh, uh, top donors, where is it in here, had, had spent something like uh, $100, $100 $100 million against it. This is a classic case, is case where you, if you attack an economic interest group, they're going to, to fight back. Now the issue is should drug prices uh, that the state negotiates for Medi-Cal be at the same level that the federal government negotiates uh, for the, the, vet, the uh, uh, vet, uh, veterans, for the, the uh, VA hospitals, which seems like a fairly simple issue. But the drug companies have, for years, had negotiating uh, uh, processes, and they've obviously worked out how they how, they, how they, they price things for the veterans, and they price things for other people in a different way. And they are actu actually, the reason that they're spending so much money against this is not that it would affect them that much in California, but they want to kill it here so it doesn't spread to other uh, 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 states. It's a matter in which most Californians, 99.9% .9 have no idea what the issues are, uh, the campaign against it, against it has been very clever. They've trotted tr tr out the, the, the veterans in their VAW hat with their combat medals, and they say veterans' drug prices are going to go up. There's no proof of that, but the bad old drug companies might say, well, if we have to reduce the Medi-Cal to the veterans' level, we're going to up the, the, the veterans' price. And so that's the argument against it. My sense is, and Bob... I'd like to hear, hear your thoughts on this, that this is the classic case of where you get a confusing ballot measure, millions and millions are spent against it, and the public says, hey, it's not my fight, I don't have a dog in this battle, and, and, they, vote, and uh, they vote no. Yeah, if this gets 40%, I'd be surprised, yes votes, I'd be yeah. surprised. All, all the newspaper editorial boards are also against it. This is sponsored by the AIDS Foundation, and Tony is absolutely right. What this is all about is that the drug companies want to nip this in the bud. They don't want other states to do what California is doing. California, believe it or not, spends four billion, the state spends four billion dollars on drugs. Yeah, it's lots so of this money. could have a, a, a big impact, but not a, probably nothing impacting any of you in, unless you're on Medi-Cal, unless you're a state employee, or unless you're possibly a veteran. But it, again, it probably won't affect the veterans. But because so much money is being spent, and some money is being spent for, I think 10 to 15 million dollars yeah. is being sent, spent for it, it's almost certainly going to go down. Yeah, I suspect that, although the question is, well, if, they're, if we're spending too much money, the state, this is the state of California and, and the drug companies. If we're spending four billion on drugs, how come we haven't, as the state of California, forced the price down? Why hasn't the Medi-Cal administration or the governor or somebody said, hey, we should not be paying more for our drugs than they sell to the, to the uh, 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 veterans. I mean, that's a pretty good question. And this could, whatever the issue here, could probably be resolved if the state itself said, hey, drug companies, we're not going to spend any more money. Okay, more questions. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I'd like to push the panelists a little bit more on Proposition 54. Um, first of all, Charles Munger Jr. is the largest individual, or one of the largest individual contributors to Republican legislative candidates right. in the last couple cycles. Um, it seems to me I, I don't uh, I don't mistrust the motives of the League of Women Voters or other reform groups behind this measure, uh, but it seems to me that this is not a good faith attempt by Mr. Munger to increase legislative transparency. 
uh, there were competing legislative attempts at transparency that came up as a result of Mr. Munger putting forward this initiative uh, in the last legislative cycle. And those went through the entire committee hearing process and I think personally would have been better, better attempts at transparency because they went through the process and they were made by legislators who understood that the gut and amend process or the gut and amend technique can be beneficial for creating compromise. Uh, if Mr. Munger was seriously interested in transparency, uh, maybe he would have pulled his initiative and allowed those proposals to move forward. Um, the video recording component could have easily been enacted by statute. Uh, instead, Prop 54 ties that to Proposition 140 money, so it has to come out of the legislature's budget. Uh, it seems like Prop 54 is kind of a punitive attempt by Mr. Munger, the only person spending any money on it, uh, to harm a Democratic legislature that's likely to regain its supermajority. Any thoughts? <laughs> we'll very, put you very good, very good argument. We'll we'll put you down as undecided on the measure. <laughs> now, now it, it's Charlie, right? Char Charlie's mother uh, is the chief of staff for Senator Ben Allen, who um, spoke to my class this last week, and Ben Allen made some of those arguments and said that Munger refused to negotiate with the legislature in terms of trying to work something out. The problem is the legislature actually, the Senate did pass something saying it had to be 72 hours, but it was a, as a rule, and the assembly refused to go along with it. So the question is, would the legislature go along with it? If they passed a rule or even a statute, they could always repeal it. So, and, and Munger, as Tony indicated, also was involved with the redistricting commission, which, which I think was a terrific reform. And I think this is a terrific reform, and I don't see how it hurts Democrats at all. It just helps the public. Yeah, it's very odd. I mean, uh, uh, the Democrats do not have the two-thirds majority that they won in 2012, in, in certainly in the Assembly and probably not in the Senate, due to the money that Munger, you're per perfectly correct about that, due to the money that Munger put in to uh, uh, re uh, Republican candidates in 2014. And that was, on the whole, a pretty good Republican year. If you remember, they got the U.S. Senate back. And while they didn't win anything statewide here, they did win a few uh, legislative races that had Munger not been there because the Republican Party in California can hardly raise any money on its own. They probably would uh, not. So questioning why he is suddenly the great uh, reformer from the perspective of a, of a uh, Democrat is, is something that, that does make some uh, sense. I might add that I didn't know this, but Charlie's father is an old friend of mine from, from uh, Capital Days also. also. And, and Charlie's fa father is the partner of Warren Buffett. Huh? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, Munger's money comes from, from his father. He didn't, didn't make the money himself. <laughs> Munger, Munger's money, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> Munger's, Munger's money comes from, uh, I don't know where your money is. <laughs> 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 Munger's money comes from Warren, from his daddy. Had nothing like uh, having a rich uh, daddy if you want to dabble in politics. And uh, his daddy is the partner to, to Warren Buffett. All right, more questions from the audience. There's one over here. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is in regard to uh, marijuana legalization. Um, it says in the uh, ballot sample, which I have in front of me, that the uh, revenue produced by it goes to specific purposes. But that seems like vague language in my mind. Did you know any of these specific purposes that this uh, Legalization Act would go toward? Yeah, the reason it goes for specific purposes is that any initiative which says money goes to the general fund is always questioned by the voters saying, wait a minute, you mean the legislature is going to control where this money goes? We're not going to vote for it. And so the opponents always say, oh, it gives the legislature a blank check. Well, the money goes for, for enforcement, it goes for drug testing, it goes for education, uh, and, and a whole number of things that they specify in the initiative. Um, and that's the reason why it goes for these specific purposes. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, um, I actually think that that's one of the problems with the initiative process is that the, all the earmarking of money creates um, distortions in the normal budgeting process, it's sometimes called ballot box budgeting, uh, which is to say, typically you want revenue streams going into the general fund and the legislature through the budgeting process allocates money um, uh, depending on the priorities of the state over time. And 
what the initiative process has done over time, ver various interest groups have um, allocated funding streams or portions of the state budget for particular purposes, which might be um, you know, uh, appealing to the, the, the voters at a particular time, but might not be the best way to allocate resources over the long term. So um, that's my concern about that. that yeah, the, the, the uh, legislature really does have, a, have a, 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 a good argument here against that particular process. What if there's not enough money to do what the measure says? What if there's more money? Uh, we have this uh, 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 stem cell uh, initiative. We have a, a, a commission, the stem cell uh, commission was set up, I don't know, 10 or 12 y years ago. There are all kind of, of course the money was not, the legislature has no role in the money. Uh, the uh, uh, taxes were, that the money that's going to do stem cell went through a particular body and there's a lot of questions about whether the people that put the initiative together actually have now made, made, have made money uh, from it because they control the flow of the revenue, the uh, uh, legislature doesn't. So generally speaking, it's a bad idea, I think, to earmark these funds away from the legislature being able to deal with it. I mean, their job is to pass the budget. If they, uh, in my view, if they just passed the budget and went home, we would be better off to, uh, for all the stuff that, that they uh, do. But that is their main job, and so you make it much harder when you pass things that have uh, these, these earmarks in them. Of course, if you don't, don't pass this, there's no money, so <laughs> yes. this, is this is clearly additional money that the state would not see otherwise. Oh, yes. And, and you know, right now, of course, we have a lot of marijuana sales going on that are illegal, and we have no taxes on those. Um, this would make it legal, and we'd have tax money coming in. Okay, question there. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, can you speak about the uh, two plastic bag propositions, 65 uh, and 67, especially the effort uh, of those who put it on the ballot to sort of confuse voters, and if there's any precedent for that? Yes, I'll talk about that, and I have written a couple of articles about this. I was 100% opposed to the bill that went through the, uh, the uh, le uh, le uh, legislature. For one thing, it is attacking not all plastic bags that you find in your grocery store. You'll go in there and you can still get a plastic bag and put your apples or your oranges into it. So as far as plastic bags being bad and doing all these bad things, I don't know why they didn't deal with that other than people like having the bag to put their oranges in. Um, now the way this thing got through, this is the legislature at its worst. The grocers, you would think, would be opposed because if you the old days, you go to the grocery store and Skippy the bag boy says, paper or plastic? And you can pick paper or plastic and it's free. Well, it's not free anymore. Under this measure, if you go to the grocery store in a, in a, in a, a city that has uh, uh, the, the bag thing, and in, in it's, it's now in effect in quite a few areas, uh, and, in, and, and certainly it's, it's in effect where I live, I have to pay 10 cents for that nice free paper bag. Uh, and so what this thing uh, did was, first of all, the, this, is out of, this is not all out of uh, state bag uh, uh, manufacturers. A lot of these bags that are now gonna be illegal were actually made here by uh, uh, you know, uh, people working in, in, in blue collar jobs in California. I don't think it's a good idea to be killing off any more of our blue collar jobs here. We, we, have, we have too few as it is. But this was kind of cleverly done by the bag folks. First of all, they put a referendum in and that, st that stalled the law. Uh, so it would not take effect. That was a year and a half ago. So you've had a whole year and a, a half without this law in effect. Then they qualified this Proposition 65. And guess what it does? It takes the 10 cents that you pay for your now uh, reusable, supposedly, plastic bag or your paper bag, and instead of giving it to the grocers, it gives it to the uh, 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 general fund to be spent on uh, in, in, in environmental causes. Uh, I mean, that, this is certainly not the bag industry's interest in having s somehow more money spent on, on environmental causes. What they're trying to do with this, and I don't know whether they will succeed or not, is kind of a misery loves uh, company. 
if they have to no longer be allowed to make their bags in California, they're not going to let the grocers get the extra 10 cents that comes from their not being the, the free, free bags. So that's my view of the whole thing. Yeah, I'm really stunned that the plastic bag industry is not spending money against 67. I mean, I expected them to spend 10 to $20 million I, yeah. against it because, again, when money is spent against an, a measure on the ballot, it generally goes down. I have not seen any money, any ads against 67 or 465. So I think what they're counting on is 17 measures on the ballot. I know I was talking to a fellow student of mine uh, today, and she said she's voting no on everything. And so that's what they're counting on, is people voting no on everything. Yeah, there's a tendency on the uh, uh, re referendum measures for people to vote no. If you're against the referendum, and you say, I don't think the referendum was a good idea, well, you would think you would want to vote no. But if you want to defeat the referendum, you have to vote yes. And I was worked years and years and years ago on a couple of referendum measures. And convincing people that if you're against the thing, you have to vote yes is really tough. And so if you look at the history of the referendum as against the initiative, about 90% have gone down. I completely agree with you on they missed the boat on not spending uh, money to get a no vote on 67. Hi, thank you for your talk. Mr. Stern, I think that you touched on this briefly, but I saw a field poll um, recently that said that for Proposition 58, 70% of voters are gonna vote yes on it, only if they read the, the title and the summary. But once voters actually hear more in depth what the law would do, it's much more split. So it seems to me that most voters are really only going to read the title and the ballot summary since there are 17 initiatives on the ballot. So how do you think that the state of California could either reduce the number of propositions on the ballot if that is a problem, or you know, work with the existing system to make sure that people are making more informed decisions and actually know what they're voting on when there's this many propositions on the ballot? Yeah, we don't give tests for people on voting. Um, what I have found in studying the process is that generally when the voters vote yes on a proposition, they are rarely fooled into voting yes. Very few initiatives are passed where the voters were fooled, but they're often fooled into voting no. And two-thirds of initiatives in, uh, in history have gone down. So most of the time, the voters will vote no. But you're absolutely right. Most voters, unless they see ads on TV or get these mailers uh, or s study these videos, are only going to go into the ballot box and see the, the very brief des description of the, of the measure, and they sort of vote their gut feeling on that. And yet, if you take a look at the results, they are rational results. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, the voters kind of seem to know what they are, are doing. I worked uh, for a, a company that generally worked against ballot measures back in the, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So I worked on several different cycles. What we found was the people that put these things together tend to put too much stuff into them. You can look at the Look at the text here. My God, there's pages and pages. Well, when you go through the text, you will find something that they didn't think about. For example, on the, on the drug thing, they didn't figure on when you start dealing with the veterans benefits and veterans drug costs, you're going to have all of a sudden the ability of those, the opponents to say, aha, they're going to, they're going to screw the veterans. So you've seen on TV, the veterans are there in their, in their veteran hat with all their medals on saying, vote no. I mean, the, 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 the proponents probably never figure that. Uh, it is easier to, de to defeat a complicated uh, measure because there's going to be too much in it. And the people that run the no campaigns are going to find something that the public didn't realize was there. All you got to do with the public to get them to vote no is convince them that they don't have a dog in, in this fight, that it's not in their interest, it doesn't affect them. The number of people that are affected by the, by the, the drug thing are, are probably very small. And so it's not hard to say, hey, why are we doing this? You know, the legislature, if they want it, they can pass it. Why should you vote for this? It doesn't affect you, and there might be something bad that you don't understand about, about it. Okay, questions? There's one in the back. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Catherine. I'd like to say thank you um, for your time. So my first question is in regards to Proposition 56, the tobacco tax, but more importantly to something you said earlier. 
So opponents have called it a regressive tax, saying that it unfairly burdens the poor, which you know makes sense. If it's $2, that's obviously going to affect a family that makes $12,000 a year much more than a family that makes $120,000 a year. But um, you said that it would actually be beneficial to the poor because they would stop smoking if this tax was implemented. Um, from 87 cents to two dollars and 87 cents. However, a lot of times with addictive substances, if you're already addicted, you don't s like necessarily stop spending the money on it. Um, so I was wondering if like what your thoughts were from a socioeconomic versus public health policy stance on that proposition. Well, that's you're absolutely right on all the points you raised. It is a regressive tax on the poor. Uh, I think it does reduce the smoking. It does increase their health. But if you, but as, as my, my mother smoked for many, many years, it's very, very difficult to give it up. So it does hurt poor people more than it does the, the wealthy people, but I think the health benefits outweigh that. Yeah, I mean, we've been trying to keep people from smoking for the past 50 years. And we had, I guess, are they still running those anti-tobacco ads? I haven't seen them in a number of years. Not like they did for a while. I really think a more effective way to stop people from smoking rather than raising the uh, the tobacco tax would be simply to have have more public education because smoking is not good for for you okay one more question from the audience I think there was one you got one right there good evening there's been a lot of discussion tonight about the number of propositions on this ballot and whether voters are going to be overwhelmed or whether they're going to be confused. I'd actually like to return to plastic bags and the question from the back about the interrelated propositions 65 and 67. It seems that 65 is contingent upon 67. I'm wondering if there is a precedent for one proposition being contingent upon another, and if it is unprecedented, do you anticipate that something like this will happen in the future, where a proposition will be related to yet another proposition that's on the ballot? Yeah, there's a long history of, of people wanting to defeat Measure A by putting Measure B on the, on the uh, ballot. And what they want to do, and this is exactly what the uh, bag companies are up to here, they want to confuse folks enough that they say, I don't know what this is about, and vote no on both of them. I mean, they don't really care if, uh, 50, if, if 65 passes, other than they would like to stick it to the grocers, because the grocers stuck it to uh, them. But there is, a, there is a tendency, and that's one of the problems with our system, to have uh, people putting two measures, you get there with the death penalty, you have a pro-death penalty and an anti-death death penalty measure on, on this ballot. Uh, and you very often see that, and that is kind of one of the problems that confronts the voters then. And in California, the proposition, they, it won't apply to 65 and 67 because one's a referendum, one's an initiative, but it does apply to 62 and 66. 62 is the one that bans the death penalty. If you're against the death penalty and you vote yes on that and vote yes on the other one, which speeds up death penalty appeals, um, you're actually voting against yourself because if 62 passes and 66 pass, the one that gets the most votes prevails in its entirety. I went through that in 1988. Uh, I wrote a proposition dealing with public financing of campaigns. It got 53% of the vote. There was another proposition that said no public financing of campaigns. It got 57% of the vote. My proposition didn't go into effect. Okay, well, I want to thank our panelists and a great audience for a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.